was four deaths like this one. No. Hello, everyone. Hi. I want to welcome all of you to tonight's event, Climate Change, Conflict and Migration, Myths, Stories and Reality about Climate Change and Migration. Welcome to every one of you. Very nice that you're here. This uh, event is part of a series called Getting a Grip on Migration. And after this event, there will be two more, one on the 22nd of April called Children on the Move. And the last part of the series will be on the 13th of May called Freedom Map about new cartography of migration. Tonight and the series of events is uh, organized by Studium Generale, which has a goal to sharpen your mind and expand your horizon by multidisciplinary lectures, films, debates, and many other events. And if you want to check out their website, it's on the screen right now, sggroningen.nl. You can also follow them on Instagram and they have a newsletter. You can stay up to date and maybe um, join a few more events in the future. Tonight, we will be talking about and learning about the relationship between climate change and migration. How does climate change lead to displacement of people all around the world? Uh, when do people decide to move and where do they go? Where do they end up? And what can we do to help them? There will be three speakers tonight. Each of them will have 15 minutes to talk about their uh, research. Um, and when they're finished, there will be plenty of time for questions from the audience. And uh, because we're streaming this event, if, you, uh, if I pick you out from the audience, you have to wait. There will be a microphone brought to you. And if you could start by saying your name, speak closely in the microphone, and any, everyone knows uh, what you said. That would be nice. Thank you. Um, all three of our speakers uh, are from the University of Groningen. The first one is Klaus Hubacek. He is a professor in science, technology, and society. And he has a focus on the interaction between human and environmental systems. The second speaker of tonight is Nina Hansen. She's a professor of social psychology of cultural change. Her research uh, centers on psychological, social, and cultural change caused by modernization in the global south. Third speaker of this evening is Joram Torusarira. He's an assistant professor of religion, conflict, and peace building. And his research interests are uh, the role of religion in conflict uh, and cultural dynamics in the context of migration. Uh, if you can all give them a warm welcome and an applause. <laughs> Thank you, all three of you, for being here tonight. And I would like to introduce our first speaker a little bit more. Klaus, uh, you're going to explain the concept of carbon inequality and its impact on the people, and especially the impact on the people who are the least responsible for climate change. You can pick up your microphone and tell us a little bit more about what you do. Hello, good evening. So, shall I get started with the... Yes. Okay. <laughs> good evening, nice to be here. So, uh, my talk is Global Carbon Inequality, and I want to approach this topic from those people that are contributing the most to the uh, global climate heating and the ones that are the most vulnerable. So, I'll approach it from two uh, directions. Here is a picture from a summer of two years ago, uh, pictures around the world that show climate impacts, and you see on the top right, yeah, top right also for you, uh, a heat map of Europe where we see temperatures of 40, 45 degrees in large parts of Europe. The picture next to it is quite interesting and close to my heart because it's uh, a lake near my parents' hometown in Austria. The lake dried out and uh, the fish died and perished in the sun and uh, hasn't, the ecosystem hasn't recovered since. And the other images are other places in Europe, Asia and Africa. The Scientific American uh, in, a, in an article named this, the hot, this hot summer is one of the coolest for the rest of, of our lives, indicating that from now on the temperatures will be increasing and they looked at different cities in the US and the temperature increase that is predicted over the next couple of decades. In, in addition to the temperature change, uh, what's equally worrying or even more worrying is, as it's named here in this article in Nature from a, year, a few years back, a potential threat to civilization indicating that 
uh, human-driven climate heating is uh, triggering uh, earth, different earth systems and tipping points that are connecting and leading to a domino effect potentially, triggering other tipping points and amplifying the contribution of human-made uh, climate heating. Here is the, the same tipping points listed, uh, and you see the blue vertical uh, bar is the temperature uh, that we want to stay within uh, according to the Paris Agreement from 2015, where the global community agreed to stay within a 1.5 or maximum 2 degree increase since the Industrial Revolution. And the, the uh, horizontal bars show uh, at which temperature those tipping points can be potentially triggered. So the circles within the bar tells you the most likely uh, temperature at which the tipping points can be triggered, and the width of the bar tells you the uncertainty range. But as you see here, that uh, many of the tipping points are already triggered at potentially trigger the temperatures below a 1.5 degree increase. The, the problem is that these are model based that, um, or partly based on observational data and it takes a while to realize that those have been triggered. So potentially we are already in trouble but just don't know it yet. So the question then arises, how much carbon can we still emit to stay within 1.5 or 2 degree increase. A very useful concept in this context is the uh, carbon budget. So what you see here is on the horizontal axis cumulative CO2 emissions because many of the greenhouse gases linger in the atmosphere a very long time, 100 years and longer in some cases. Um, <clears throat> that's why we need to look at cumulative emissions. On the vertical axis we see the temperature increase. If you see the lines underneath this stylized uh, graph, you see the uncertainty ranges. But what's obvious is that there's a very clear connection or correlation between uh, cumulative greenhouse gas emissions or uh, cumulative CO2 emissions and temperature increase. So, um, which allows us then, in a way, to uh, link policy to emissions. So here, for example, you see if we want to stay within 1.5 degrees, so the line from 1.5 to the, um, <coughs> the diagonal, and uh, go down, then you see the amount of CO2 emissions we still can uh, emit cumulative CO2 emissions to stay within 1.5 degrees. If we exceed those, what is it, 2,500 uh, gigatons, then we have higher temperatures. So if we are at 3,000, then we are already at 2 degrees, 4,000, 2.5 degrees, and so on and so forth. Right? And ideally, if we stop emitting, then the temperature will also, not immediately, but eventually, with some uh, there is inertia in the system, also stop increasing. So we have to reach zero to stop the global heating. So this figure shows the same idea again, but uh, what you see here is um, for a year 2000 or so, a vertical, uh, 2020 it is, a vertical uh, line. Everything to the left is already what's in the atmosphere that has led to the increase in temperature that we increase. Everything on the right, the brown area, is what we can still safely emit to stay within 1.5 degrees. So here we see a net carbon budget of what is it, 580 gigatons. Of course, this figure is already a few years old. We are now below 300 gigatons that we can safely emit. And that you, if you look at the vertical axis, we have 40 gigatons per year. So within a couple of years, that stuff is uh, used up. So here again, we have the same figure more or less. So now in order to get to zero, I don't know if you remember the Paris Agreement, the Glasgow Agreement, almost all countries in the world agreed to net zero by 2050 or 2060, right? So this is the black line you see from the current state going to zero, to somewhere here, right? But obviously this is an ideal line. What's happening is the brown area above the black line 
shows that we are still emitting way more than we should. And all that stuff we need to get out of the atmosphere. So that's the emissions uh, below zero. So the more we emit today, rather than getting to zero as quickly as we can, the more negative emissions we have to absorb. So meaning planting trees and so on. The problem really is this area here, we're still increasing emissions. So even 2023, last year, despite all the agreements, we still had a slight increase in additional emissions. So the emission growth is growing still, right? And so this is the frustrating part. So even this gray area there is the Paris Agreement targets of the different countries doesn't get us anywhere close to where we should be going. So that leads me to the next question of what is the extent of global carbon inequality, of global inequality? Um, and I want to use some images from this nice book from some 20 years ago, Material World. Um, so the photojournalist asked families around the world to put all their material possessions outside the house. Right? So you could see in one picture what everybody owns, how wealthy they are. So just imagine yourself putting all the stuff you have inside the house and bring it outside. It could take a day or two, at least in my case, with uh, having a couple of kids, a cat and a dog. But anyway, so let's look at some of the um, pictures from around the world. So it's certainly easier for India, the Vade family. So all the possessions are up front. You see a couple of uh, bags of rice, some pots, and uh, a bike in the back. We move to Mali, Natomo family, two wives, seven kids, and a couple of pots and pans, and again, a bicycle. We move to China, the Wu family, in Yunnan province. Um, here we see TV and all kinds of stuff in the back. The interesting thing here is China, of course, in 2020 was a different country. It has grown 10% every year, so meaning the Chinese economy, roughly, is eight to 10 times as large as at the time when this photo was made, so 20 years ago. Meaning, on average, you would see eight to 10 times as much stuff in front of that house that you see today. And then we move to Tokyo, Japanese family, the Ukita family, you see a uh, uh, all kinds of appliances, kitchen appliances, washing machine, a car, I think, in the background, 130 square meter living space, and then we move to the US, Texas, I think, the Skeen family, you see two trucks, lots of stuff. Again, even in the US case, the economy grew by 3.5%, meaning it's twice the size than it was roughly at the time this photo was taken, on average you see twice as much stuff. The average housing size is 220 square meters, you have to heat and cool that, lots of carbon emissions from that. All the things that need to be produced here create carbon emissions. So the more stuff you have, the larger the house, the larger the carbon emissions. And so this indicates already the problem we are facing. So now, what is the extent of global carbon inequality? This figure here shows uh, two bars. On the left, you see the population and the income distribution. And you see that the lowest part, the green area with 1.25, um, now it's a bit more adjusted for inflation. So this is the income per day for the ex people in extreme poverty. So if you uh, earn less than 500 euro, roughly, a year, then you fall in this category. And if you look at the second bar, then this group of 800 million people or so is responsible for 3% of global carbon emissions. Then if we add the next bar to it, so everybody below $3, so that's about $1,000 uh, a year, 1,000 euro, it's almost the same. So if you earn more than 1,000, you're already in the, in the top half of global income earners. And their contribution to climate change is 13% in total for the global half, bottom half. And then the top 10%, so if you earn more than 8,000 euro, you belong already to the global elites and are responsible for contributing to 
43% of global carbon emissions. So you see a highly unequal distribution in terms of how different income groups uh, contribute to global, to the global carbon problem. And so here you see per capita carbon footprints. So in the poorest countries, it's one ton roughly carbon equivalent versus in the richest, it's close to 30 times as much. There are, of course, huge differences within countries. So um, the top 1%, of course, have a much uh, higher uh, carbon emission footprint. Uh, this uh, shows quite nicely the, the difference also in terms of here you see US fridges, which are now quite popular in the Netherlands, I hear, with an ice maker, right? They uh, use three to five times more electricity than the average person in Nigeria. So if you look at the fourth vertical or horizontal bar, US today best buy fridge has 700 kilowatt hours versus per capita electricity consumption in Nigeria is 150. So now let's bring those uh, streams together. So we have on the top Again, uh, a map of CO2 emissions per capita. The reddish color shows that the uh, northern hemisphere have the highest emission footprint versus the southern hemisphere have relatively low emissions, the blue colors. But if you look at the vulnerability, how people are affected around the world through climate change, then the colors reverse. So the least vulnerable are the top the northern hemisphere, the ones that created the problem in the first place, and the most vulnerable uh, are the ones that have least contributed to it. And so now, what are the effects? So here I have this uh, rather provocative title about the climate migration myth. So this map was uh, put uh, published 2005 or so by UN organizations linking climate change directly to migration, saying that tens of millions of people would move every year due to sea level rise and so on. But one can't take that one to one because uh, for a variety of reasons. For example, some climate change phenomena, phenomena are slow moving, giving people time to adapt, adapt. So there are various different adaptation strategies to cope with environmental stress, to move close by, to have dikes and boulders, as in this country, to change livelihoods if that's so easy. Like the fishermen in my hometown, uh, they have to move to different profession. The vast majority of people tries to stay put. They don't want to leave their hometown. They move over short distances and try to come back as quickly as they can. Oftentimes, it's very expensive to move, right? So they do not have the resources to move large distances, and people get stuck. And we'll hear more about that in just a moment. So let me summarize. This uh, sculpture is in Berlin. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called politicians discussing global warming. So let me summarize, I started out with uh, the Scientific American statement that this summer, from two years ago, was the coolest year for the rest of our lives. Then I was explaining how we're quickly using up our carbon budget and potentially triggering other even more important problems like CCAP melting and so on that are connected, leading to some domino effect and affecting other important Earth systems. Those most vulnerable tend to be the least responsible for the problem and I showed how a fridge in the Netherlands with, that makes nice ice cubes consumes five times as much um, electricity than the uh, average person in Nigeria on average. and that climate migration is only one of several adaptation strategies. People don't necessarily choose to move, but oftentimes have no choice and get stuck. And with that, I hand over to you. Yeah. Well, Klaus, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was um, 
a lot of very shocking information, frankly. I think most of us are aware, that's probably why we're here, of climate change and the problems uh, and the causes, actually, are sitting right here. Um, but those really hard facts really, well, put it in perspective and made it even more important, I feel like. And it was very useful that it was illustrated by real-life examples. I think that made it very touchable and real to us. Um, as you said, Nina is our next speaker. Um, you're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, the insights you've gained, uh, about where people on the move in Africa actually end up, uh, what challenges they face, and what actually gives people the energy to keep going um, when they end up in those situations. And you also did a little research about um, the position of women in these situations. So I'm very looking forward to your contribution. Thank you. And thanks a lot for the invitation. So I will continue the story to um, take you on a journey, first static with uh, some figures to illustrate the problem at hand, to define a bit what are the categories, what are the people who are on the move, so to say. I'm going to fly in, in on a continent where many people end up as refugees to illustrate a bit more their living conditions. And I'm going to share a bit of our research and how we try that uh, academics also try to you know, support getting data and designing wise interventions for people who are living in camps where they can't leave. So let's get started with the data, what you can see on the screens here. Um, I chose to um, show data from 2022 because I can then show also other data related to that year. Um, in 2022, 108,000 million, more than 108,000 million people were on the move around the world. And this is approximately 3.6 people of the total population in the world who had to flee their countries. Oftentimes because there were armed conflicts, they were maybe um, um, persecuted, there was violence, sometimes also because maybe there was a too dry season or too many floods and um, they had to move a bit because their cattle couldn't get any green grass anymore. But the statistics don't say how many people move because of climate change. Because this is a more complex topic, and um, Joram, our next speaker, will talk about more about that. But what you can see here on the graph on the left, on the right side, is a, a very steep increase of people having to flee their countries. 35 million, 0.3 million ref are refugees around the world. And refugees are people who had to flee their country because of, of different reasons. And they managed to cross the border of the home country. But 62.4 people are so-called internal displaced people. These are people who had to flee their home territory but couldn't cross an, any, any international border. And as you can see, these are almost 60% of all refugees around the world. And those are not the refugees we, we see in Europe. They are stuck <coughs> in their home countries. Um, those people um, end up in very difficult living conditions. I'm going to show you later on a bit more how this may look like. Um, they end up in places where there are conflicts, they're in the, in the fire case, so to say. The majority of people um, have a higher mortality rate than, than, than people of the host society. Often they are deprived of any shelter or food or assistance. Um, so these are very difficult living conditions. 5.4 million people are asylum seekers, are people who crossed the international border and filed in their documents and are asking for a residence permit. And 5.2 people also in newly introduced category by the UNHCR is a category of people who moved across international borders but have not still yet registered anywhere as a refugee or as a, um, an asylum seeker, may not have any documents. So this is a category you can't place in all the other categories. I would like to know from you, and just a, a, a short quiz, um, any idea which country is the country that hosts the largest population of refugees around the world? Any guess? Just shout. Turkey, Turkey. Turkey yeah. Any other guesses? Lebanon? Lebanon? It's Turkey, with 3.6 million people um, um, waiting in, in Turkey. Any idea which is the second largest country? Greece. Greece. It's uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, because that's also an area where we are have, actually many of us have no real idea what's happening there and how many people have to flee the countries. Mm -hmm. And number four, on number four, there's the first European country. Any idea which European country that is? Germany, Germany with 2.1 million um, refugees in 2022. Just to give you an idea what the numbers are. Um, 
just going to move on. Um, here you see another graph, and this may look a bit complicated, but I would just quickly walk you through to illustrate that when you may read the news, you may think, okay, many people may move to the Netherlands or Europe, but when you look at this graph, you will clearly see that on the left side above, there are 27, 2 million people in sub Saharan um, Africa who had to flee the country of origin, and the majority, when you follow the blue color, actually stay within that region. So the majority, those are people who really are oftentimes internal displaced people who have to move in within their country and they get stuck, so to say, somewhere else. You can see the same phenomenon um, for the Asian Pacific region and um, many other reasons as well, but there is very little cross-continent migration happening, just to illustrate that a bit. I promised you a journey from figures to pictures uh, to life experiences and would like to take you on a trip um, with me for a short time to Africa, to Kenya. Kenya, two years ago, was the country with us, um, hosting the second largest group of refugees in, in Africa. And this is just a place to explain how this looks like. This is one of the two biggest camps um, that up in Kenya. Um, at the moment, they're around 300,000 people living. There's another camp, I'm going to show pictures as well, that has half as much people living there. You can see streets, you can see some shelters, but living there is not easy. As you can see in Kakuma, this is another camp um, in Kenya. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show you um, or explain to you the, the difficulties that people change uh, face there. So people move there because of persecution or conflicts in the home countries. And depending on you know, which area is closer to the camps they go to. And in Kakuma, there are 18 different nationalities. 18 different nationalities with different religion, with different norms, with different ways of living. Living there closely together. There's, the environment is not really welcoming in a way because there are high temperatures, poisonous animals, often breakouts of malaria, cholera and other diseases. Um, this climate makes it almost impossible to do any agriculture activity to, to feed yourself. There's limited access to electricity and a shortage of drinking water. Housing con houses are constantly being destroyed by wind and rain because it's a very harsh climate. And physical and mental health of people living there is, is, is very challenging. So people really are oftentimes, what you can see, a fence there. Um, and you might think, oh, nice, then maybe can have a work, but in, during the pandemic time, when, when we started with a group of international scholars, and Madeleine, who's also here, also joined that project, um, at that time, all camps were closed because of the, the COVID outbreak. People could not even leave the camps. So the space they had around the house was the only space they could move and do things. They were totally dependent on any, any help from outside, and not much help could enter these countries because of international travel restrictions. In addition, people who live in those camps are very, have very little opportunities to work. But at the same time, people can be very resilient uh, to survive and to keep on going. And this is just two pictures to illustrate um, and to give you an idea how life continues. Because there are no formal jobs people could apply um, to get a salary and become financially independent, many of them start trying to you know, start up a small business. And uh, at that time, um, at the pictures time, there were around 2,500 different small micro businesses in that camp. And this is, you know, a fashion shop, and you have um, um, Wi-Fi retailers, you have uh, shops to buy stuff, you have laundry shops, very different sort of services are offered in those camps by refugees themselves. In other places, just to give you an idea how people fetch the limited water, that they do it maybe once a day, and sometimes there's no water, uh, and this is just the basic things that you can imagine. What we do in our research um, um, is we can't lift lives, or, so to say, but what we would try to do is trying to understand, and I'm a social and cultural psychologist, trying to understand what helps people to keep on going in, in those circumstances. Because if you know more about that, you might be able to think about different interventions or trainings or social activities that may help people to survive and keep on going. We conducted a lot of interviews with people in those different camps from different regional um, re religious backgrounds to, to learn more what they enjoy during the day or during the week. And here we'll quickly summarize what are the main things. 
So one of the most important themes that returned in, in many of the conversations uh, we had is what we call social connectedness. So people mentioned that just being together with others, having meals together, for example, not feeling alone, um, but also feelings of social connectedness. So knowing that you matter for someone, that someone waits for you to come to the next meeting. These are social things where it became very clear that the relationships that people have and established there are very crucial for them. Next point is social support. Giving support for others, helping them maybe finding a job or surviving or taking care of an ill um, family member gives people a feeling of sense that they do something. In the other way, receiving support from others, knowing that you're not alone and people care for you, are also very often recurring themes. A smaller group mentioned that having ideas about the future but about the future is limited in the space of the camps. It's not the way that they can go to an office and apply for asylum here in the Netherlands, for example. It's there in the camps. And another important point is spirituality. And I just mentioned that people come from 18 different countries, with different religious backgrounds, different customs, and um, going together to church, for example, or to the mosque, crying and singing together during the day at the beginning or the end of the important moments where they gather together. So especially those spirituality, social connectedness, and social support clearly say being together with family, learning to get to know other people, taking care of each other, meaning something for someone, other things that let them keep on going. And we are using those insights to now create a scale to use that in other research um, to learn more about, you know, you know, do people still have the resources um, to keep on going? You also mentioned beginning my research focuses off, um, very often on the position of women and the reason why I'm especially interested in the position of women in my research and with all the PhD students I'm working together is that women are often the motor of a family, especially in those cultures which are more, so to say, collectivistic. <coughs> See, in the Netherlands, you're, you're raised in a way that you start thinking what are your own abilities, what you're good at, what kind of job you would like to have. It's always the focus on, on your own growth. Whereas in very collectivist societies, it's, it's more the goals of your family or your tribe or what religion requires you to do. So if you would ask the question to children in elementary school, so what is your aspiration, what kind of job would you like to have? I think in the Netherlands you would hear many different things that people want, or students want to become. Whereas in many collectivistic cultures where we do all the research or where people flee, I, I would think that the majority of students would say, I would like to become a teacher or a nurse or a doctor. Jobs that serve the community and by that make the parents and the family proud. So this is a very different focus on, on how you decide things in your life compared to European countries like the Netherlands. Learning more about that and learning you know, what is needed for women is crucial to really help families lift. And many um, good uh, um, programs are focusing on women especially. And you may have donated money for good charities for microfinance services or microcredits for women, but these women are not isolated individuals. They are part of their family, ingrained in the expectations and the social norms how women should behave. Giving a money, woman money of course can help to maybe set up a small income generating activity, but there are also other constraints. Normally maybe the husband handles the financial issues. So interventions need to understand really the position of women to enable them to strengthen the position of the, uh, of the families because we should also so they more often pay back their loans, they invest in education and health for the family, so these are investments for the future. But I guess also my next, next speaker will share about more about that. So I'm just a researcher here in the Netherlands, but I collaborate with different organizations around the world. And I just want to summarize very quickly how we try to understand this context the, where people live in humanitarian crisis to help offering data or insights that hopefully inform policymakers. And one part is, this is a picture from a pro um, um, project we conducted in Ethiopia. Um, with children from minority languages groups. Um, they, for the first time, had the chance to go to school to learn in their mother tongue, which so far was an oral language where there was no word book. Mm -hmm. So this project invested into 
studying this oral language, making books available, teaching um, teachers to tr teach in their mother tongue, and by that, especially God's profit from this education, because normally they are more closer to the huts, they don't meet other people, whereas boys have a much bigger radius. They're more mobile and can, you know, oftentimes learn other languages in the neighborhoods. But especially these projects made sure and encouraged kids, girls to be able to go to school. And here we are just, we are trying to test some school um, results, but also this is um, a measure of finding out what kind of group is most in, uh, important for the children, whether it's their religion, their tribe, their family, and we wanted to see whether there are differences between the different children. So we do collect these data, we, we help developing scales, especially also in the camps in Kenya, to understand the situation of people. And this is so-called, we call it panel data, which is used by World Bank or UNHCR, to learn more about the, um, the yeah, situation of people in humanitarian crisis. And this can be compared, but then can also be used to inform policymakers to think about policies where to invest money where it's mostly needed. The second part of my research looks at how to design interventions which aim to improve lives of people or to lift the position of women especially. And here you can see a picture um, where Randolin is, is working with uh, our colleague in Tasnuva in, in Bangladesh. And this is a project which was set out also by the government in the Netherlands because the government wanted to know, so where should we invest on? You may have heard about the sustainable development goals and the idea is, can we maybe invest into nutrition or maybe invest into women's empowerment, and maybe by that we have many more so-called spillover effects. So for example, giving women a training, maybe then they make wiser decisions with nutrition, maybe also with, with related to health indicators. And what we are doing in, in, in this project, um, especially Madeleine with the colleagues in Bangladesh, trying to develop a training to make women aware that there are opportunities for them to make sure that their family's well-being is improved and by that, hopefully, have a bigger say in other decisions in the household. And this is um, another way where we try to bridge our knowledge um, to areas where, um, together with people, and that's the most important, with partners, with the people on the ground, to work together what they need and what they would like. And by that, hopefully, um, change their mindsets and increase um, yeah, opportunities for their lives. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your attention. Nina, thank you so much. I think um, it really gives us a different perspective on, on what helping can mean. And that it's more than just water, food, shelter, but that humans all over the world have different values and that it's important to meet them where they are and in that way make new interventions, as you said, to help them in a better way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, then it's time for the last speaker of tonight, Joram. Uh, you're going to talk more about uh, what value-based approach is and how it's a crucial addressing climate change and what the role of religion and culture can actually mean with displaced people and how they meet and interact with each other. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can I loud, can I be here to the back? Okay, thank you. I See, the, the, the advantage of being the last speaker is that, you know, people who speak at the beginning, they either lay the foundation for all that you're going to say, or they speak everything, and at the end you have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you think we are? But anyway, I will uh, take a different approach to addressing the, the topic that we are discussing today. And as she indicated already, I'm going to sort of take or approach the topic from what I call a value-based approach, which is basically about integrating uh, values into the climate change, conflict and migration discourse. And my, my point of departure to this discussion is that the, the outcomes of the interaction between climate change, conflict, and migration is not only uh, a function of the adaptive capacities of those communities, which is often based on techno-scientific capabilities, but it is also based on the values that people hold very dearly. And this is my point of uh, departure. And um, allow me, therefore, to just sort of speak to the connection that we're having today, which is basically climate change, migration, displacement, and conflict. I think the immediate uh, flow of, this, uh, of these variables is that when we have climate change, you know, we, because of uh, shortage of resources or scarcity of resources, people then migrate to look for better livelihoods. 
And when they move, they are not going into empty spaces. They are going into spaces where people are already living, and that means they are going to compete or clash over the little resources they are, so there is bound to be conflict. And when we have conflict and we continue to try to leave, we continue to use you know, the same environmental resources, the same natural resources, and that might lead to environmental degradation or deforestation, thereby speaking back to climate change. So the relationship between these variables is not linear. It is actually cyclical. It could also be this way, that when we have climate change, we immediately clash, and when we clash, we end up in, in conflict, and then when we're in conflict, then people move to other spaces, so they migrate, and when they migrate, they interact with the environment, they interact with the natural resources, and that again speaks back to, to climate change. So the point I want us to sort of speak to, which, co which is also about addressing the myths, is that there is a necessary connection between climate change, migration, displacement, and conflict. It is not the case. The relationship is cyclical. And also, uh, it does not necessarily mean that when this climate change impacts, that is also going to lead to migration. So there can be other elements between climate change and migration, or between migration and conflict, or between conflict and climate change, that also interrupts the relationship and might redirect the outcomes. But for the most part, what we see is that policymakers, researchers, and practitioners spend most of their time in a thinking that is very linear. This is what happens, and this follows, and this is where we end up. That leads to development of uh, unsustainable interventions and policies that go at a tangent. So I think it's always very clear for us to understand that this dynamics is very, very complicated. It's not, this is not very, it's not straightforward. Having said that, allow me to sort of speak again to the dominant approaches that I see taking place when policymakers and practitioners attempt to respond to uh, the negative impacts of climate change or the negative impacts of climate-induced migration and related conflicts. Here we are just speaking to conflicts, but it could also be that the outcome is not conflict, it's actually peace. Because when you migrate, to a context where you have to compete for, for resources, it's not that you're going to fight, but it might also be the opportunity for you to learn how to share. So when we see migration, we should never just see it from a negative point of view. This is out of which the whole discourse of environmental peace building emerged. But what I wanted to speak to now is that the dominant approaches that we see uh, you know, being deployed tend to look at the problem as a very a biospheric problem, an environmental problem, uh, and it's about people's vulnerabilities. And, you know, you, it's about measuring probabilities. You know, if this happens, that will follow, and so on. It's about mapping socioeconomic and political factors. It's also about quantifying the cost of goods. How expensive is this? this how cheap is that? And when all that analysis is done, interventions are developed and deployed in a top-down approach. This is very problematic because people's lives is not made up of things that are only quantifiable or physical. There is more, and this is often not taken into consideration during the process of developing interventions and approaches. So, what is lacking, therefore? If you are saying this is what is going on, therefore what is lacking? I want to speak to it in this way. What is overlooked for me is the whole idea of values. And what is a value? Basically, a value is what matters most for you. That which determines how you make decisions and how you take action. And for me, as somebody who works at the intersection of religion, culture, and society, I'm very much interested in the influence of religious or cultural values. But I think the question we have to understand or ask ourselves, or answer rather, before we move forward is, why is it important for us to understand values? And I, I have some answers for you. Values give us insights into how things ought to be for a people. They also give us insights into how one ought to interact with the world. Values give us insight into the basis upon which people make preference judgments. There is a measure, there is a standard of that what guides you in making uh, judgments. It also helps people to assess what is wrong or what is right. 
as well as what is the right way of interacting with the environment and what is the wrong way of interacting with the environment. They also attach specific qualities and characteristics to certain places, objects, activities, places, and so forth. They determine what ought to be protected and what ought not to be protected. So if you go to the Maasai community in Kenya, cattle have to be protected. Yeah? This is based on what they value. The values also help give us insight to what can be tolerated and what cannot be tolerated. So when all is said and done, values express what matters most for the affected communities. And to what extent, therefore, do policymakers, researchers, and practitioners factor this into policy formulation and, um, and uh, development of, of programs and interventions? Now, you might be saying, okay, that sounds all good, Jora, but how can you take us down to actually see, like, in concrete terms, in concrete terms, how, how do values shape the interaction between climate change, migration, conflict, and peace? And I'm just going to share some examples. And my job is going to be very easy from now on because my colleagues here have really spoken to some of the issues that I wanted to speak to. So, thank you for that. <laughs> um, I just want to speak to the whole issue of conflicts that arise in, say, uh, refugee camps or in IDP camps. So IDP is standing for internally displaced persons. So uh, in a research that I was involved in in northern Mozambique, so for those who are familiar with what's going on there, you, in northern Mozambique, the province called Cabo Delgado, there is ongoing conflict from insurgents, but also uh, people are displaced from that region by floods and cyclones. And they move down to the uh, a province just below called Nampula province. That's where you have IDP, uh, one of the IDB camps. So that's where I was, for example. And what we observed there was that there were so many uh, conflicts that were arising on the basis of different religious and cultural beliefs. People were not uh, sort of, uh, you know, agreeing and understanding each other in terms of how to live. I mean, Nina just mentioned the whole idea of so many nationalities being in one place. But with IDPs, these are people from within the same country, but they also have different religious and cultural beliefs. One concrete example is that people from the north believe that when you bury your dead, you bury them within your yard. But for the host communities, you needed to have a separate cemetery where you would take people to. This might look very small, but there were lots of conflicts around this because death is something that is very intense and how you deal with your dead is really, really very important. And this was something that we, we observed in, um, in Korani IDP camp. Just to give another example that has already been spoken to, we realized that in camps, women's roles do not stop because they've moved to, to a camp. They have religiously and culturally defined roles fetching water, fetching firewood, feeding the family, taking care of children, taking care of the elderly. So the impacts of climate change, the negative impacts of climate change in these, I mean, to, I mean upon these people is hardly felt also by the women. Why? Because of the values that are within the communi communities. But to what extent then, I repeat, do policymakers and researchers and practitioners factor this in Developing interventions, I think, leaves a lot to be desired. I want to give you another example, mobility and immobility. Uh, here I chose to use mobility and immobility because there are also some who are having problems with the use of the word migration because it has been securitized so much and it has been politicized such that even efforts to address it are actually leading to further problems. So for now, let's talk about mobility and immobility. There is a tendency to think that um, due to the impacts of climate change, people will move. But what you also observe is that people do not move, and I think this has been mentioned also. People do not move, not, only, not, not because they have no means. In some cases, yes, they have no means. But in other circumstances, people are attached to particular places. People have cultural ties. They have like, social status, like chiefs. They have gender roles, they have kinship obligations, which they cannot leave. And this is based on their religious and cultural values. Some move just shortly and return to their original homes. And I think Klaus made reference to that earlier on. Why? For religious, cultural, and spiritual reasons. 
the extent to which policymakers, researchers, and practitioners integrate this, for me, remains, um, uh, it is quite wanting. I like the, this citation from a 61-year-old farmer who, when he was asked why he was not living in the face of extreme climatic conditions, floods and cyclones, and uh, his response was, this is the land of my grandparents. Even if I had billions, I would not leave. This might sound something like, oh, well, really? But yes, people do stay put on the basis of their cultural ties and things that are very important to them. I want to speak also to the, uh, to the presence of uh, religious traditions within camps. And what I observed when I was in Maratane refugee camp, that is in Mozambique, in northern Mozambique, was that when I moved around the camp, I saw churches, I saw uh, mosques, and you know, the, the different religious traditions present, African religious tradition, uh, uh, religions as well. Um, but when we discussed with the refugees and the host communities, it emerged that religious spaces, as Nina also mentioned, as provide coping mechanisms. They are places of hospitality, they are places of hope, and there are also spaces where people exchange ideas. For the host communities in Mozambique, they actually told us that, you know, we learned about how to establish businesses from those people, from, uh, from the refugees from other communities. So this gives me an opportunity to actually say, when we look at migration, we should not only see the negative uh, you know, outcomes of, uh, f from the processes, but it is also an adaptive capacity which, if well handled, <laughs> can actually lead also to something um, positive. So these are some of the examples that I wanted to share with you. And in conclusion, what therefore do I think could be a way of you know, integrating also a value-based approach? I think it's important that we integrate techno-scientific and economic approaches with religious cultural values and other values people might be subscribing to we need to consider what we might refer to as the determining values. What is it, um, that de what values determine how people make decisions and interact? This is very important because the values can be referred to as the organizing principle. That means they guide how people do their lives. So regardless of how much techno-scientific you might be, if your inventions and technology contradicts what people deeply value, they are not going to go anywhere. And having said that, let me repeat what I said at the beginning. The outcome of the relationship between climate change, migration, conflict or peace is not only the function of the adaptive capacities of the people, which is for the most part based on techno-scientific capabilities, but it is also a function of what people deeply hold. Let's have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. Um, first of all, do you guys, after listening to each other's lectures, do you have any questions for each other? Things you might wonder? Or you don't want to stay kind to each other, don't want to be too <laughs> stern to each other. Because I was wondering, you guys were talking yeah. about, oh, you do have one, yeah? Yeah, I, I have one. Go actually. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I want to direct it to, 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 to Klaus. So you really deal with the, the climate science part of it, which I think is indispensable and very important. So do you say space for values? Mm. In, uh, in the techno-scientific paradigm or framework? Nice question. Thanks for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still digesting your talk, but I think it's all about values, no? I mean, uh, the, the, the photos I showed from the families around the world, our consumption patterns to have a, a big car, hopefully bigger than the neighbor's car, an uh, ice maker with our fridge, that's all about values, right? And so to look at consumption and not consider values is, is missing a big piece, right? So in the end, the underlying everything is, is values and we just don't make it as explicit and try not to target it or have avoided 
mis-targeting it, but uh, that's what I take from your talk. So thanks for reminding me. <laughs> um, I was listening to um, how we can know more about the values of displaced, pe displaced persons and displaced people. And that kind of made me wonder how aware are policymakers of their own values? Uh, are there any ways of uh, preventing that the policymakers in question are kind of projecting their values onto the people they're trying to help? Is there any awareness about that, you feel? Or? Um, oh, thank you for, 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 for yeah. that question. I mean, I think basically, uh, as far as my assessment is concerned, there's very little awareness. Mm. And this is why I actually try to bring f this forth. And uh, so to, to bring this consciousness in my research and work, I collaborate also with uh, uh, some organizations and we hold workshops with uh, policymakers. So I've been doing this, for example, in, in Kenya. I did this in Zambia. I did this in Mozambique and my next stop is going to be in Zimbabwe. Mm. But the idea is to impress upon them that in responding to these challenges that we have, we need to go beyond the tangible, beyond the physical, because people are much more than that. Mm. And I think there is, we need to do a little more around that. Mm. 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 And you briefly touched upon the whole world, migration, mobility, um, the word security issue, Phil, we also talked about this in preparation of, our, of this event. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Maybe Nina, can you elaborate a little bit more about the whole world, the word security issue and securitization of immigrants? Very big words, what do you mean? Yeah, I think just from my work is, is, is in the moment where people leave, or have to flee from the homes, they leave back beloved ones and also a kind of security. And oftentimes they have to leave because there is no security anymore. But going to other places where people live different ways, it's not being safer oftentimes, especially when they're on the move. So you've seen the, the pictures of, of the camps. These are not the greenest areas in the countries. So oftentimes this is in the, in the fire case of, of con, um, armed conflicts. So oftentimes it's, it's just, you know, they're leaving insecure places and through their journey they're, you know, heading um, towards more insecure places and where safety plays an important role. So I think oftentimes the term is also used people on the move because they have not arrived yet. Hmm. All right. Thank Does you. that answer a bit your question? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? The sir over there with the hat. Could you reach? Yes, thank you. Andere Kapuz, I have a lot of time done with studying in landbouw. I find here no enkel word over where come all that food from. Is it from our outgebuiten boeren and surpluses? How is that? Because food is what heel erg belangrijk is ook in Afrika, uh, in Mali bijvoorbeeld, uh, Peul, hebben we ruzie met elkaar, hmm. omdat er voedsel met problemen zijn. Ik ga het proberen in een Engelse vraag samen te vatten. Um, our guest is asking about the role of food production in this whole conflict. Is it a, does it have a cultural values that you can maybe identify? Has it ever played a role in the triangle you may be made, can anyone, does anyone have an idea about that? Um, I could uh, try. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Phil, for the, for the frage. Um, I think the, when we look at food, in, in uh, of course, just in some parts of Africa, because we cannot generalize about Africa, yeah, but some parts of Africa, I think there is, uh, there is some value and sometimes some quality and meaning that is also attached to particular food foodstuffs. For example, traditional grains are also connected to cultures, and uh, sometimes uh, one of the sort of uh, encouragements that is taking place now is to try to invoke people's cultures so as to encourage them to grow traditional crops which are drought resistant in response to food insecurity. 
So sometimes you can also bring these, uh, these connections together mm -hmm. because the particular food stuffs, you know, like sorghum or, 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 or a pork or finger millet, you know, they, are also, they have a traditional value, they have a traditional meaning. But, you know, with, uh, with modernization, you know, there was a transition from the traditional grains which were connected to, uh, to traditional ceremonies and traditional practices to maize and other what would be called uh, modern crops, I don't know. Um, uh, but this was just part of the whole uh, modernization process. But I think now there's an attempt to revive those, not only because uh, they are drought resistant, but they might mean more even to people now. So there is this connection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say, yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, hi, um, I'm Nazanin Zadeh Cummings, uh, and I want to thank the three of you. I think this was such a fantastic evening, and the three of you brought really different insights. Um, so my question is about values, but it's also about those pictures of families in this material world. Um, I'm American, and I have to say, I was actually surprised at how little was in that American photo. I was cringing, <laughs> waiting for it, thinking, oh, it's gonna be us, that we're the worst. <laughs> but, you know, and to me in those photos, they're, they're, when I think of what an American household owns, there's values in there too, right? And so, you know, um, in Joram, you were talking about values in quite this positive way, and I'm curious about what might be some of the um, kind of downsides to values, values that maybe have led us into these problems, particularly, um, you know, those of us that are part of the problem but are not necessarily experiencing um, the effects of climate change as people are in other regions? Thank you. Is there a particular speaker you want to uh, answer your question? Whoever wants to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> or wants to go first, every, every one of you. <laughs> I take this one because um, I had the same question. I'm still thinking about your question and now you uh, reinforced it. And so, so clearly on the northern hemisphere being part of the, the problem, we uh, have values and the question is why is that? Does it have to do with giving us security and that we need to adhere and, and cling on to those values even though they have led the whole world into trouble to some extent? But the same is true for conflicts, as, as you described it, right? So you were saying that, and of course it gives hope and is positive, but you know, the funeral practices of one group might be detrimental to the environment and so on. So the question is not just for us, but for everybody to, should we change values? Should we question them? Should we look for new values that uh, allow survival of, of uh, people in that in that context and uh, on, on this planet and so on and how to do that, right? Which values to change and how to lead such a discussion. So, so I just add a few more questions <laughs> to your question, but that's what you made me think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I go first? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I'm happy that you raised this because this often comes up when I am having discussions around this, like, okay, fantastic. But I think two ways of responding to this. First, values are not static, you know? They are dynamic, they keep changing, so we have to know that. And secondly, not all values are positive. So when we call, when I call for integration of values, it is about understanding that they are values that drive people to make decisions certain ways or to act in certain ways. So it's understanding and not necessarily endorsing. So to understand is not to endorse. But what we're saying is, let's know that there is this variable, and let's engage with it, and let's see how we can promote those values that lead to climate, climate uh, resilient uh, practices, and let's also see how we can engage with the negative ones with the intention to see if we can move away from those. Because indeed, you're right, some practices can be detrimental to the environment, and we, I just made reference to what the, uh, some values also do when it comes to the roles of women. You know, we, we need to engage with this. But first thing, know about it and acknowledge that it exists. And don't just explain it away as if it's not there. 
because you miss an important part of the puzzle. And I think this is what we see in policy and practice. And I think we need to really engage with this. I would like to bring another perspective on values in it, because um, values are very abstract terms, what, what we um, would like to have, what we envision, or what is important, what lays the foundation, how we relate to others. But oftentimes, it's acted out in a very different way. And I'm now jumping a bit from the context when you think about integration in the Netherlands, or in Europe in general. Interactions between a newcomer and a host society member may go a bit weird, because there are different ways of, of looking at each other, looking into the eyes or not shaking hands or not, there are different ways how you greet someone in different cultures. But if you go on underneath this behavioral surface, oftentimes there's a value of, of respect, but how it's you know, shown outside, it's very different. And then interpretations are done that if this person is not uh, um, respectful enough because he or she is not shaking my hands and not looking into the eyes, where the looking away is a deep sign of appreciation and respect. So I think it's, it's not only about talking superficially about values, but knowing where it comes from and why. And I think there's a lot of overlap between cultures about taking care of each other and caring for the environment. But on top of that, modernization has changed how we act it out. And consumption, I think, plays an important role in that. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you all for your contribution. Anyone else who has a question for Yes, in the front? Could you stand up when you ask your question? Yes. Hello, oh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate the three of you, first of all, because this is not easy to do 15 minutes <laughs> to a general audience like this. And so you all did it very well, and the three spoke together very well. So I just wanted to say that. But what I think, hearing about the conversation pertaining to values, what I think I saw across all three of those was that values was play very much present in all three, but also this idea of relationships. How is it that we relate not only to other people and the role that relationships play and the w relationships we have with places and the relationships that we have with things. And so they can reflect the values and they can be part of the problem or the relationship could be part of the pro process for making a positive change. And so that was just something, just hearing you all, uh, because you did such a good, clear job of speaking, <laughs> I was able to sort of see that thread across all three of yours work. So, okay, that's it. Not really a question, just, <laughs> just a, compliment just a comment. <laughs> thank Great, you. Thank you so much. It's good to hear. I see a hand near the door, a girl with glasses, I think. Oh, you both have glasses, as you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> next to next people's first. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole. I'm a student here. Thank you for your presentation, first of all. Um, I have a question for Nina and another one for... Joran. Joran, sorry. Um, so, um, I wanted to ask you in connection to what we've been talking about, relationships and importance of support system in resilience to climate change. Um, do you think uh, for researchers there is a way to measure the material uh, effect of, um, of supporting system and relationship? For example, uh, is it actually the case that once you have like a big support system, but maybe you are in a climate adverse region, uh, you can still live long. Uh, while if you are lonely and you, are, you, are, you live in an individualistic country, then you, you risk to live less uh, mm -hmm. long than that. Mm -hmm. um, and my second question is kind of related to this, and it's about, uh, so we, we've ex we are experiencing right now a trend in the world where the Western Hemisphere is, um, mm, gr there is atheism growing. So less, less religious connection and we can say also linked to that growing uh, loneliness problems, individualistic societies and all that. While we see that the overall trend within the world is the growing of religious values, because in let's say the so-called developing countries, even though we know that it's not the right term, uh, religion is still very important, as you showed us. 
Do you think in the long term, um, thinking about policies and development, do you think this would actually um, be the case in the future also for developing countries? So once they reach a certain stage, then they will host also uh, be less tied to um, values, religious values? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Two great questions, I think. Thanks a lot for those two questions. I will start with the first one, um, the question about the relatedness, how important that is, and whether this can help people survive in, in very harsh contexts where climate change destroys nature around people, for example. Um, based on, on, on my own research, but also on other research, of course, I think we are not isolated individuals, we relate to others, we are social beings, you know, being meaningful to someone, being loved by someone is, 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 is a, a need that people have, being recognized. And I think having a, a surrounding where you have family with you, um, or people you chose, because maybe you have to let leave your family or you lost your family, but to choose others who support you, I think is, is a very crucial resilient factor um, to survive in a new place. Being totally alone, that's also what you see on data when you see you know, refugees who, who had to flee alone, don't have a network with them. They do, you know, they experience more loneliness than those who have a network around them. So I think it can help a lot, but as long as you can still survive, if there's no water and food anymore, I think then, uh, you know, then the material things weigh heavier, but as long as there's enough of that, I think then the social functions of relationship matters most. Are those things quantifiable uh, in your experience, in research? And what we're trying with in this project, which I mentioned, where we are, we are, we are actually developing a scale to measure that a bit mm. more. Because what I've seen when I look at all the statistics, you can see suicidal rates or rates of depression, so all on the negative side of mental health. Um, you know how much possessions people have, so poverty indices are measuring what people have how much income they have, but you know very little about what gives people energy to keep on going. And we are trying to do that now with this new scale. And we hopefully we can continue the work soon and then hopefully it will also be implemented in other camps and other contexts of humanitarian crisis to, to know more. Because you want to know who survives and who might be able to, to, to lift out of the situation and not only know how depressed people are. Because right. that's what the statistics normally show. Hmm. Right. Um, regarding the second question, which was about, do you guys suspect a rise in atheism when developing, between air quotes, countries um, develop more? Do I summarize it well in that way? Yeah, all right. Do you guys have any yeah, ideas? Um, uh, what, what I would say, I mean, I think what you're speaking to is what in the, in, in the study of religion yeah. is referred to as... Uh, you know, the secularization process, right. you know, and uh, I mean, I see my colleague uh, Goraz Andres is in the room, I feel like calling on him to answer this one, but I will take it myself. Um, <laughs> He's shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think uh, the, the claim that the religion was on the decline has since been proved actually to be wrong. Actually, religion is on the rise. So, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see a situation where religion will actually go down. Uh, in, um, in, let's say, for example, in most parts of Africa. I mean, the, what can happen is that it just changes. You know, it changes, but people still subscribe to, to religion, and also research is actually showing that, you know, yeah, Islam is increasing, Christianity is increasing, and it, we, we don't see a, a, a future where the, the trend is not, is not, it's not going to go down, at least as we can work with uh, uh, the methods we use until now, mm. but it's more that uh, people continue to be uh, more, they're, they're still religious, and it might, the difference might be how they practice that uh, religion, but we can't say that people move away from, um, from religion. Uh, from religion. There's, there was, for some years ago, the so-called secularization thesis, which was really saying, even in Europe, religion is going down, it's going down. But people who have really been championing that have actually started talking about the desecularization thesis, which actually say, means, you know, actually, religion did not go away. Maybe what just changed is how people practice it. But values that are connected to religious frameworks or spirituality, they still remain um, in place in one way or the other. So I would say I think religion still plays a role, it's still there, it's still rising, 
And I think uh, we just have to in, uh, connect to that fact and factor it into, um, into programming and policy formulation. Thank you. Can I also quickly add to that? I think sure. um, I was just thinking about research from political scientists who studies the endorsement of different values over decades of years, since the 60s. And this research shows that maybe people don't go any, not, not so many people go to church services on Sundays anymore, but the values that come with religion, taking care of your neighbors, of your friends, um, be, being a bit maybe obedient to your parents, those are values which are much more entrenched in culture and take much longer times until they maybe fade away. Maybe it's the practice that may change a bit in our societies, but the value not exactly. And I think next to that there is another perspective. It's the question of loneliness, who's lonely. And um, I'm just reminded of a former PhD student, Lucia Hoy, of my, who studied loneliness across cultures. And uh, you would expect maybe loneliness is higher here, but that's not necessarily the case. So it, it depends on the quality of relationships you have. So in a more collectivistic society, you may have more people around you, but your expectations, you know, what they should serve you and how understanding they are might be higher. And maybe that might be kind of disappointing and lead, you know, triggering moments where you feel lonely. Whereas here in, in, in the Netherlands, for example, you may have not so many people because your family is not that big and you live alone in a student house or whatever, but you can choose the people you want to be with. And maybe you have a, one friend who's very nice and caring and that you know, serves all your expectations, but then it's, you might feel isolated a bit because there's just one person, but the quality you get from that person may greatly differ. So, and I think that is also important to keep in mind when we talk about loneliness or being alone. Um, related to that and uh, triggered by your first question, um, what that reminds me is that it's really important what indicators we use, right? When I showed um, my data, it was GDP and income. And, um, but what we should use is different um, multidimensional indicators and look also at happiness. right? And happiness research shows that exactly what Nina just said, that people are happiest based on social relationships, right? So they do this standardized survey across the world and ask um, how happy you are at the moment from one to 10 and what are you doing at the moment? So they link their happiness to activities and it's most of the time social interactions that makes people happy. And what the research also shows is that uh, in the rich countries we have decoupled. So even though GDP so activity, economic activity and wealth is growing, people are no happier than they were before. So it plateaus. So we just have an empty economy that creates and destroys uh, values, converts uh, forests into furniture and so on, but it doesn't make people happy, mm. right? And so we need to have additional indicators that look at social relationships, social networks, happiness in addition or instead of GDP, for example, and income. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think the person next to you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I actually don't know if my question fits in here, but I'm just going to ask it anyways. Um, because when we talk about solutions, or about solutions for climate change, it's, it's uh, often about reduction and doing less and emitting less CO2 and I think in the wait I took some notes because I knew I would forget my <laughs> things uh, yeah and I think talking about values I would maybe also assume and then talking a bit more on the state level then if we talk about values we also definitely talk about egoistic values taking care of yourself of your community of your own state and then I think also in the debate about climate change often comes the obviously like climate justice the imbalance between north and south uh, the global north and south, um, so that like the global north and the very rich countries had now dozens of time to emit all the CO2 they wanted and develop their countries and their economy and stuff. And now I feel like it's, which is always a tricky part of the conversation because you don't know what to answer, I feel like, because I feel like it's very much fair that less like poorer countries say, no, now it's our time, now we want to become independent and we want to have a stable economy that we don't depend like on um, yeah, bigger countries. Uh, maybe that's also a Western perspective for me, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm just more curious what 
you what your thoughts opinions on that like how can we achieve that like how yeah because in the sense yeah because the, sorry yeah their economy developing means also emitting co2 and then i'm right. like okay what how can we have this conversation yeah I doubt you have a complete answer to that question because it's a big problem, but maybe you have some thoughts about it. Um, just just my, my quick one would be when we also talk about values, also justice is also a value. Mm. So it can also then drive the actions that we, that we, we make and, or, we, or the decisions we make and the actions we take. So mm. there are many other values uh, in addition to religious cultural values. Mm. Uh, so justice can also be uh, one of those values. Mm. Yeah, it's all about values, no? I mean, one value can be that you earned your money and you can spend it, right? And so if you're a billionaire or a millionaire, you can just spend it and uh, basically kill um, people with it, right? Because that's what happens. Uh, climate change, every year, seven million people die from air pollution, basically, and we allow that. So that's a value. But because we have the money, we spend it and we burn things and people die from health impacts and we just accept it as a society, right? These are implicit values to some extent. Uh, so in terms of how to change it, one is to make values explicit, to show. Uh, and most people read the World Health Organization's report every year, see that seven million people, half about this indoor air pollution, so that's uh, poverty related, the other half is outdoor and that's um, burning fossil fuels and we just accept it, right, as a global community. Said, well, there's nothing much we can do about it, maybe more investment in filters and so on. So that's one thing. The other thing is that um, our own models have shown that if we move people out of poverty, so fulfilling uh, SDG 1, uh, eradicating extreme poverty or moving everybody out of poverty, has very low carbon impacts. So even if you uh, double the income of the very poor people just because their carbon footprint is so low, it doesn't really matter much. The carbon budget is used up by the high income earners, right? And then it brings it back to, to values. So should we high income earners be allowed to create that problem and uh, kill other non-human species and people on the way or should we not? It's a really difficult question. And, um, that we should ask ourselves, right? And what can we do as individuals within the context of a power system that it's based on coal and natural gas and, and so on, right? So it's a really difficult question. <laughs> but uh, in terms of poverty alleviation, that shouldn't be a problem. Th those carbon emissions we can easily deal with. What we cannot deal with is the carbon emissions of the high income earners. Mm -hmm. and that's partly us also. Do you not think like if people double the income that they would have different choices because they have different yeah, tools to start from? You, you mean uh, if we move people out of extreme poverty, they would yeah, make different choices? Well, the assumption in the models is that if you, instead of $3 per day, have 5 or $6, you spend the, your money similar to other people with five, six dollars. So we know exactly what you spend with three dollars, we know what you spend with six dollars, we calculate the carbon footprint, we multiply it by 800 million, and you know what the carbon implications are, and it's still very small in comparison to rich people's carbon footprint, as I've shown with that bar, the top 10%, us, 43% contribution, the poorest 800 million, 3%, double that, still not much. But I think another value would be fairness. And I, I, I think I got what you're saying, that it should be, it feels fair that it would be their turn now to consume in the way we do, because this feels very comfortable to us. And that feels like it, well, we shouldn't allow that in a way, and it feels unfair. Yeah, that leads to another discussion. One, of course, is also uh, the historic emissions, right? So mm. the US, Germany, the UK, o over the time of industrialization, have used a, a big part of the carbon budget, right? So, um, so we need to look at that, not just today's emissions. Um, in terms of fairness, um, 
Can you repeat your question? It's fair that other people should have Well, it a feels fair that we, we've all been consuming and not thinking about ah. what it does, and feels fair that it's their turn now. Okay, now, <laughs> so we can do that both. We can have the, the cake and... Uh, Eat it too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and how we do that is economic growth, right? So what we are saying, we don't need to redistribute, we don't need to uh, reduce our own consumption, all we need to do is have green growth. And you, mm. I'm sure you have seen it in the news, politicians talk about it the whole time. It's the, the whole discourse on decoupling, sustainable growth, green growth, which is all uh, an impossibility. Mm. It, it's nonsense, basically. And we can show that, how we just shift from one problem to the other. So even the green energy revolution, so to say, in order to produce solar technology, you need certain materials, minerals, where are they coming from? It's a, another form of colonialism. It's extraction in poor countries again, mm. right? Mm. And uh, so now we try to evade uh, and escape the dependence on Russia in terms of natural gas. What we do is create a dependence in terms of minerals from a couple of mines for lithium, uh, from the Congo Republic, uh, from South Africa, 80% of renew, uh, rare earth minerals are from China. Mm. So it's another form of dependency, right? Mm. And mm. so uh, there is no free lunch, as economists would say. Um, so in terms of fairness, we deal it by, by growing and telling us the story about green growth and, mm. and the renewable energy transition. But it also has problems. It needs lands, it needs water, it needs resources and so on. So what to do about that? Hmm. We have to change our values. Yeah. You know? So it w would be most fair for us. <laughs> That's true. It would be, would be most fair for us to reduce our emissions, so there would be space for growing economies, people who now live in poverty, to maybe slightly increase their emissions. Yeah, we have to gain a, a, the same level of um, well, welfare. Is the Dutch word? Um, can anyone help me? Which English yeah. word? Welfare, yeah, the same level of welfare. Yeah, we, we are going towards a world with 11 billion people or so by the end of the century, right? And so certainly we have to do exactly that. We mm. have to stay within the planetary boundaries. Um, I don't think I had the figure, but we don't only overshoot in terms of carbon emissions. We also overshoot in terms of other environmental uh, indicators in terms of biodiversity, land systems, uh, plastic pollution, and so on. So we have pushed the planetary boundaries and exceeding them, and we don't know how they interact, as I showed with the domino stuff, right? Mm. So I think we are really in trouble with, if we don't change our, it just always comes back to changing our yeah. values and have a debate on, on yeah. what's really important. Thank you. I saw a question here in the front a few minutes ago. Yes, there's a lady over here in a beige sweater. Thank you. My question is that uh, the carbon emission is, is uh, increasing and uh, uh, temperature is also in increasing due to carbon dioxide. So emission is from the developed countries and affect, uh, the affected countries are the underdeveloped countries and they are suffering a lot. So what values are saying to the developed countries, uh, for those countries who are affecting, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. every year the floods, droughts, uh, insect attacks are coming, heat waves, and the people are dying. In so, uh, My question is, what the values are saying to the developed countries? Mm. What our values but are values? How they can compensate to the uh, mm. affected countries. Mm. Mm. Does anyone have a question? Uh, an answer to that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, compensation, right, is, is uh, the key word here. And so, uh, based on the Paris Agreement, and I think even earlier agreements, there is a, a global compensation fund to um, pay $100 billion every year to help with uh, transition to um, low carbon emitting technologies and so on. And, um, but that obviously is, is not enough. But that would be a way. Uh, another one is, based on recent research, is to actually have a carbon tax uh, higher carbon taxes. Um, at the moment, most countries have some sort of carbon pricing. 
but at the same time most countries also have some sort of subsidies for fossil fuel extraction and consumption which is amounting to 1.5 trillion dollars and last year was higher than ever in history so we are doing the wrong thing so what we should do is remove uh, subsidies into fossil fuel extraction banks and so on still um, our fossil companies are still uh, extracting and making more profits than from renewables so the whole structure needs to change and then the carbon tax should be redistributed towards new technologies towards people in need because it will increase the cost of living and so on so so it needs a big reorganization of the economy that we have at the moment thank you i was just gonna um I was just going to add also that, uh, you know, I think it was COP26 and COP27, the loss and damage fund was also discussed. And uh, I mean, this is also a one way of trying to deal with the impacts of, uh, of uh, I, mean, I, I mean, the impact on those that are actually not emitting that much. So to make those countries that are emitting more to also contribute to the loss and damage fund, and that money will also contribute to addressing the, those challenges. So it was, I think, uh, the discussion heated uh, up in Egypt and then just picked up in UAE. And, but the last time I checked, uh, the, the, loss and f the loss and damage fund was empty. Mm. But uh, I think there's, this discussion is gaining momentum as a way of addressing these uh, imbalances uh, as well. Thank you. I think we're going to do the last question of tonight. It's always hard to pick that one. I think you was first, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maya, thank you for tonight. Uh, my question is, we talked about values tonight and what happens when they clash. And I'm trying to figure out, like, how do you move past, uh, like, when these intense values clash and to prevent, like, policy stagnation or halting of developments? Uh, is there a concrete example? Like, I'm curious about what happened with the cemetery situation. Uh, just how do you move past that, past, like, recognition and com uh, communication of these values? Mm. Does that make sense? That's a good one. <laughs> how did they solve it? Did they solve it? <laughs> I, actually, I thought the, 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 the next question was going, not going to be on values, but <laughs> 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 it's not happening. <laughs> Um, well, but I think it's, uh, so, so basically the type of conflicts we end up having is what I refer to as value-based conflict. And uh, basically to go past this is you have to dialogue, you have to engage, and engage in uh, what a colleague of mine was talking about the other time, in the cultural engagement, getting to really mm, go deeper to understand what drives the other person, what drives other communities, how do they make their decision, what is important for them. Mm. You know, because otherwise, if you don't do them, you continue speaking past each other. So engage, dialogue, they, let there be deliberate effort to integrate the values and move beyond, uh, I think, as Klaus said, that thinking that uh, you know, these uh, quantifiable measurements, the GDPs, the sort of economic indexes, are going to solve the problem. They are not going to. We, you know, they, the changes that might come from these quantifiable processes while necessary and important, could only be incremental. But what we have to look for now is transformational change and not incremental change. And you can only achieve transformational change when you go deeper mm -hmm. to the roots of the actions and the decisions. And so we just have to impress it upon policymakers and uh, inf those with influence to really say, you know, transformation is only going to come if you go deeper to the underlying uh, um, uh, the roots of, of what, we are, what we are faced with. So I think engage, engage, and engage. Dialogue, dialogue, and dialogue. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think um, that's something we might take home, because you say policy bankers have to, are the ones who are in charge, who have, to, who have an impact, uh, who need to think about their values. And I think, in a way, we also are in a position of power, and the way we consume, and the way we uh, we think about our own values and what we find important. I think that's something we maybe can take home um, from tonight. Thank you all very much for being here for this wonderful evening we had. Um, thank you.
up to our speakers, you're welcome to, if you have any more questions. <laughs> if they can, <laughs> still do so, yes. <laughs>